Welcome to Ken's Labyrinth. Well, there's a lot of games out there that have served as inspiration for my own designs, most of those games were developed by multiple people. Ken Silverman, creator of the Build Engine, is the only independent programmer who's produced several different things that have greatly inspired my own efforts. And today we're looking at one of his first such creations, Ken's Labyrinth, arguably one of the first independently made Wolfenstein 3D clones, and also one of the first 3D games I ever really got into, preceded only by stunts. It's a very basic game by today's standards, and even when it was new, it was a little tricky to get used to, but it's highly imaginative and offered a lot of firsts for texture map 3D games. So let's just jump right in and take a look at the game stats. Ken's Labyrinth was of course developed by Ken Silverman and originally published by Advanced Systems at the start of 1993, which is the company run by Ken Silverman's older brother. But only a couple months later, and after a few additions to the gameplay to bring it up to version 2.0, it was published by Epic Mega Games instead. It's a one-player first-person shooter, sporting a standard VGA 320x200 2-6 color graphics mode, but also a special 360x240 graphics mode, which didn't actually work on the vast majority of systems at the time. Oh well, works fine in DOSBox nowadays, so that's the mode I recommend you use. It supports digitized sound effects not only through a Sound Blaster card, but also through the PC speaker, a feat that wasn't easily accomplished back then. Like, while the digitized PC speaker sound works fine in DOSBox, most systems at the time suffered very grainy static when playing digitized sounds through a PC speaker, since, well, let's face it, those things were never designed to play sound effects like that. The music card selection is different, and while there is PC speaker music support as well, it's the kind of music you would expect from a PC speaker, and only really worth listening to if you want to question your sanity. I instead recommend setting the music mode to ad-lib. As for the game's current release date, Ken's Labyrinth has been freeware since the end of 1999. You can download it directly from Ken Silverman's website at www.advsys.net slash Ken. And not only will you find the original versions of his game, but you'll also find a hardware accelerated source port that I highly recommend playing instead of the DOS version, for numerous reasons. Now before I get into the story, you may notice in the gameplay footage on screen that my reaction time to the various gameplay elements is somewhat inhuman. When I record footage for ancient DOS games, sometimes in order to get really good frame rates for these videos, I have to set fixed cycles counts that are really high, and this slows the gameplay down on my end of things, but records it at a rate that plays back at a normal speed. Obviously this makes the game easier to play and allows for better reaction time, but Ken's Labyrinth isn't exactly a hard game anyways, even though it plays really fast. I mean, heck, if you spend your coins right and find most of the secrets, by the time you reach episode 2 you'll be able to stay in a constant and legitimate state of both invulnerability and double damage for the rest of the game. Thus, if you want the game to be challenging, don't use the vending machines. There is a difficulty select as well, but all this does is alter whether the enemies can fire shots at you or not. The story of Ken's Labyrinth is a little weird. Basically, these aliens on the distant planet Zogar have been scouring the universe looking for alien races to provide them with worthy entertainment. Worthy entertainment being to put them into ranged, confusing labyrinths to test their physical and mental prowess. Any race which failed to win the labyrinth would have its molecular structure reconfigured to turn them into coal, which would then be used to fuel stoves that produce a special red jelly that Zulgarians love to eat on their bagels and toast. I honestly don't know what to say to that. The Zagarians are led by an evil mastermind known simply as Ken, thus giving us the name of the game. Huh, did you think it was called Ken's Labyrinth because of the name of the guy who programmed it? <laughs> Anyways, under command of Ken, the Zagarians have turned their gaze to Earth and have discovered who they believe to be the smartest alien they've ever encountered. Your dog Sparky. I don't know whether to be honored or insulted. Either way, fearful that Sparky would win the labyrinth, they kidnap him and decide instead to test you out on behalf of Earthlings everywhere. Win the labyrinth, and all of mankind is safe. Lose the labyrinth, and all of mankind is breakfast. 
So now that we've established that the storyline is crazy, let's talk about the game itself. The game's actually split into three different episodes, The Search for Sparky, Sparky's Revenge, and Find the Way Home. Each episode consists of ten levels, the last level containing a boss, and when you beat an episode in the full game, you automatically go to the first level of the next episode. Episode 2, Sparky's Revenge, is interesting though, because you spend the entire episode being followed by your dog Sparky. And this has some pros and some cons. Sparky's position on the map can actually block enemy movements, thus you can use Sparky to keep enemies from coming at you. The only catch is that he also blocks your shots, so this doesn't turn out to be as useful a tactic as it might seem. Plus, Sparky's pathfinding isn't exactly perfect, and you can't leave a level if he gets lost, so sometimes you have to go backtracking to find him. At the end of Episode 2, though, you find a safe place to keep Sparky, and thus handle all of Episode 3 on your own. The gameplay is incredibly basic. You can move around, you can strafe side to side, and there's three different weapons you can acquire. Red Jelly Bombs, Bouncing Starburst Fireballs, and Heat Seeking Missiles. The Red Jelly Bombs are the most basic weapon and shoot straight forwards. The Bouncing Starburst Fireballs bounce off of walls and are thus useful for hitting enemies around corners or for finding hidden false walls that you can walk through. The Heat Seeking Missiles not only turn in mid-flight to fly into nearby enemies, but they also turn into a sort of shockwave if they happen to kill an enemy, and the shockwave continues moving and is able to hurt one more enemy. You can also have up to six of each kind of weapon, and the more of a particular weapon you have, the more rapidly you can fire it. You can also find lightning bolts, which extend the range your shots can travel before they disappear. Beyond your weapons, there's a lot of other things to find. The health power-ups include apples, chicken dinners, and first aid kits, each able to restore a portion of your life bar. Also, later in the game you'll find these hives that spawn flying insects, and if you destroy the hives, they'll disintegrate and leave behind honey. Or at least what I sincerely hope is honey, which can be consumed to restore some health. There's water fountains as well, and while they can provide a limitless amount of health, they do it really slowly. Two items you'll come across frequently are silver and gold keys. Each level usually has both of them, though sometimes you'll only need one of them to clear the level. Either way, once you have a silver key, you can unlock the silver doors, and once you have the gold key, you can unlock the gold doors. Simple enough. Two very rare items you'll come across are extra lives, which obviously give you an extra life, and the compass. The compass is so rare, in fact, that it only appears in a single level in the entire game, in the first episode no less. If you miss it, or if you start the game from a later episode, then the only way to obtain the compass is from a vending machine. But we'll talk more about those in a minute. There's four magical items you can come across as well. These magical items only last a short amount of time once obtained because they are extremely powerful. Fortunately, you can tell when they're low on power by watching your status bar, and the amount of time they last for accumulates when you pick up several of them in a row. These magical items include two different kinds of potions and two different kinds of cloaks. The purple potion allows your shots to pass straight through solid walls and also doubles the damage you can do. The green potion not only makes you immune to the shots fired by other enemies, but actually reflects those shots back at them. It greatly helps in defeating the tougher enemies more quickly. The gray cloak simply makes you completely immune to damage. It's almost a game breaker in that sense. The blue cloak doesn't protect you against enemy shots, but will instantly disintegrate any enemy you walk into, except for the walking holes. To destroy a walking hole, you have to stay perfectly still while wearing a blue cloak, and let the walking hole walk into you. It doesn't exactly work that way with the stationary holes, unfortunately, but if you're careful you can always squeeze by them easily enough, even when the corridor is as narrow as it can get. Lastly, you're going to find money. You can find money as single coins, as piles of gems worth 5 coins, or as piles of 15 coins. You can also sometimes find wall safes, and you have a random shot of finding a gem inside when you open one. Money has three purposes in this game. Buying useful items, opening pay doors, and gambling. The vending machines allow you to buy almost any of the game's items, short of extra lives and the more powerful healing items, since the apples in the vending machine only cost a single coin each. In fact, the vending machines sort of break the gameplay because you can find a ton of money in the later levels and buy extremely large quantities of the magical items. Early on though, you won't get that much money, and it's always a good idea to have some on hand to open the pay doors. These pay doors cost 10 coins to open, and you have to be extremely careful not to accidentally close one after opening it, otherwise it's another 10 coins to open it again. As for the gambling aspect, you'll find slot machines scattered through the various levels. Each one costs one coin to play, and if you hit the jackpot, you win 200 coins in return. The chance of a jackpot, however, is only 1 in 4096. But there are of course smaller prizes, and it's actually pretty easy to win back just a coin or two. In fact, the chance of winning anything at all from the slots is just over 50%. In fact, I did the math, took all the possible outcomes into account, figured out all the money that would be spent in the process, and if you actually spent 4,096 coins to see each of the 4,096 outcomes possible, 
you'd win back a total of 4,079 coins. So the slot machines in this game really are a 50-50 thing. I recommend though that before you use one for the purpose of getting some money, save your game. Then if you play one several times and fall behind a few coins, just reload and try again. You shouldn't have to reload more than a couple or three times before you're actually up a few coins. Later in the game, the slot machines are pretty useless since there's tons of money to find, but early in the game money is scarce, so the slot machines can help you get those few extra coins you need to make those purchases you want. In fact, in the very first level of the game, there's only 10 coins to find, but if you manage to win just two more above that to, for a total of 12, you can only open a pay door in a secret area, but you can also buy a purple potion to shoot down some walls beyond that door that are behind these strange magical barriers. Doing this lets you see into these rooms that give you a sneak peek of things you'll find in the later episodes of the game. Obviously, this doesn't really matter playing the full version, but imagine yourself playing the old shareware version, limited to just the first episode of the game, playing that first level over and over again, and then discovering that. And that's a very clever way to subtly entice players into buying the full version. Actually, it's pretty neat how interactive the environments are in this game. There's walls you can shoot down, walls you can walk through, doors you can open and close, walls you can see through, vending machines you can buy stuff from, water fountains you can drink from, slot machines you can gamble on, wall safes you can open and find gems inside, walls that will hurt you if you shoot them, walls that will spawn pirates if you shoot them, holes in the ground that both you and the enemies can fall down, massive fans that slap you silly if you run into them, trampoline-like nets that bounce your shots back... Wait a minute. You know, being a programmer myself, I'm starting to notice this game was probably a make-it-up-as-you-go-along sort of project. As in, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme, reason, or planning behind any of this game's elements. Now this is just a guess, but I'm betting that Ken Silverman simply wanted his game to be as interactive as possible, and to achieve this at any time he finished some aspect of the game, he'd probably just sit back and think to himself, what else can I make this game do? And then he just coded in. See, that's the approach I would take if I was making this up as I went along, and that's how this game's starting to feel to me. Not really much else to say about it, though. It's crazy, it's insane, feels like it was just slapped together out of random pieces. But you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. It's that wild and imaginative aspect that's helped inspire me in my own game design efforts. And while I have yet to make a 3D game, every time I come up with a new 3D idea, usually some aspect of that inspiration can be pulled from Ken's Labyrinth. So now let's talk about getting this game running properly in DOSBox. My first recommendation is to just skip DOSBox entirely. There's a source port that runs directly on both Windows and Linux called Lab3D SDL. It uses hardware acceleration, runs at any resolution you want, including widescreen support, and it can be easily configured to utilize a dual analog gamepad. But if you insist on playing the DOS version, then here's what you need to know to get it up and going in DOSBox. Firstly, you need to set the machine type to VGA only, set the core to dynamic, and set the cycles count to max. Doing all this will give you the best possible frame rate with the fewest rendering glitches. Secondly, make sure you leave the graphics scalers off because they don't really help the game look much better. And lastly, because there's no keyboard keys for strafing left or strafing right, just a generic strafe on button, I highly recommend playing this game with a joystick or gamepad, and abusing DOSBox's key mapper in a very particular way. You see, DOSBox is able to map multiple key presses to a single key or joystick button, so what you want to do is, with two of the buttons on your joystick or gamepad, or even one of the axes or the hat even, map one of them to both the strafe on key and the left arrow key, and then map the other one to both the strafe on key and the right arrow key. Doing this will effectively give you strafe left and strafe right buttons that do not interfere with normal moving and turning. The reason why this works is because holding the keyboard strafe on key does not affect strafing with the joystick. So what you're technically doing is moving and turning with the native joystick support provided by the game, but strafing with the keyboard by using your joystick. Pretty neat, huh? I actually went one step further even and mapped it so that I had three different firing buttons, one for each of the different kinds of weapons I could get. The only catch is that if you do use the game's native joystick support, you have to turn off timed intervals in the DOS box configuration. Anyways, that's all for this episode of Ancient DOS Games, so stay tuned for episode 23, where we're going to take a treasure hunt to the South Pole, armed with a trusty 38 caliber revolver. If you know what game that is, then send your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com, and make sure to tune in next Saturday to see this platformer in all of its four colors. Uh.